Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to David Cross. Thank you. And, and Amy, Amy Sedaris. Sedaris. Hi. I'm Cliff Lungaretti. I work in the uh, Toxic Google program. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. Thanks for having <clears> us. And uh, yeah, so if you actually, if you saw the film yesterday, which I know uh, we had a screening last night, please, we ask just no like, live tweeting of spoilers or anything, as the film is not yet available. So we want to make sure that that is something we take care of. But that said, we are here to talk about Hits, which is written and directed by David and starring Amy. Starring. Starring. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, honestly, uh, let's just look at the sign for a second, as I do love the tagline, based on a true story that hasn't happened yet. Now, if you've seen the film, I might argue that it may have happened. <laughs> well, yeah, there's, uh, not to give a, a, one of the spoilers out, but one of the things we, that's in the film uh, actually did happen roughly four months after we were at Sundance. It was a national story. I can't say it, otherwise it'll, but you know what I'm talking yeah. about. So, I felt very vindicated. Um, but that's just one aspect of the story that's happened, and pl I'm sure it's happened in Florida, or perhaps happening as we speak. Um, in Florida. <laughs> that said, so what inspired you to write this particular story? Uh, and when did you write it? Uh, I wrote it in June of 82, and uh, <laughs> very, very prescient, ahead of my time. I'd been reading a lot of H.G. <laughs> Wells, and um, no, I wrote it, uh, the, the inspiration for this particular, uh, there's two parts to this uh, answer. One is I was at a Sundance Festival uh, a couple years ago, and um, I saw two particularly egregious indie films that uh, bothered me in different ways. Um, one was just kind of an eye rolly like boring, plotting movie where nothing happened, but it ticked all the indie film boxes. Uh, I'm sure there was glockenspiel in there at some point. And, um, <laughs> and then I saw a movie right after that, like the, the next day, that really I hated. And it was just fraudulent bullshit. And, uh, and it was being celebrated at a, at, a film for, at a festival for indie film. And, um, uh, and then I was complaining about it. And I thought, all right, enough. You know, uh, uh, I should put my money where my mouth is. If the, if these things bother me, go make your own fucking movie that you like, you know, and uh, and quit bitching about other people's stuff. I mean, that's what critics do. Um, uh, they don't actually create things. I'm sorry, they just tear them down. But uh, uh, so just don't do that. Go actually make something. And then the re the second part of that answer is because of all the ideas I kind of have floating around on little pieces of scratch paper on my desk. Uh, this is the one I knew I could shoot the cheapest, which meant I had the better, better possible, you know, th there was a greater possibility of getting it made. So I, I figured, because I live uh, not too far from Liberty, I have a place up there, and uh, and a lot of the people you see, in fact, the waitress, uh, that's a friend of mine who's uh, at Baker's Tap, where your character works, mm -hmm. that's her <coughs> bar, and that's the bar I go to, my wife and I go, and uh, um, so it was calling in a lot of favors, and uh, and I stayed at my place, people crashed in my house, and, you know, so that was the reason for this particular idea. Oh, wow. Very nice. All right, we done? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speaking of making the film, you use Kickstarter? in order to fund part of the film? No, uh, we used Kickstarter to distribute it. Okay. Uh, we had made the film, we went, uh, we were at Sundance, uh, which was uh, uh, immeasurably helpful for the life of the film. Uh, uh, and we got some offers, you know, you, you, I, I'm not that uh, well versed in the business end of things, and that's partly by choice. I know it's uh, it's probably stupid on my part, but I just don't, follow numbers and things like that and I don't I don't care to but uh you know we the f producers hired a sales agent and the and this is standard for indie movies at festivals you hire a sales agent then the sales agent um acts on your behalf to talk to the distributors who've made offers and they do this all without you know I'm not privy to that stuff and uh and sales agents are one of those businesses that are so numerous in America where somebody just r invents their own reason to exist, and then now you have to use them because that's the s standard, you know? Um, and so the, the, but their best, their interests aren't about the film or getting it to as many people as possible. Their interest is as getting as much money as possible. And I don't give a shit about that. And so the producers, we got very standard 
distribution uh, plans for, for a movie like this, a, a low budget indie movie with no big bankable stars. And it was LA for a week, <laughs> New York. <laughs> Starring. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we got, uh, you know, LA for a week, New York for a week, and then maybe Chicago and uh, a handful of other cities, and then straight to VOD and apples. A apples? <laughs> apples? <laughs> How old am I? <laughs> your apples, your iTunes on apples. And, uh, and your Google Play, of course. Uh, Pac-Man's terrific. No, I don't know what Google is. I, uh, uh, <laughs> I've seen the sign everywhere. You know your font is complete. your colors are off. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, I would like somebody here, though, to explain to me how to get the Google ad things off my uh, I have Gmail, and it just constantly coming up. Uh, there will be a Q and A later, which we'll have David ask the questions, and you guys can answer. Them. <laughs> it's, uh, ads for Uber, which is a reprehensible company, and uh, and I keep getting ads for them on my phone, and like. What if I die and somebody's like, oh, he's into Uber? No. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> we to bring it back that. around, you mentioned having the mo uh, most amount of people see this film. So one of the ways you're yes. doing that is releasing it on BitTorrent. Uh, BitTorrent, VHX, uh, and, and then, you know, that's, that's a, a, a great way to get as many people to see it as possible. And, that, and the producers were the ones who came up with that idea. Uh, but I was also... Uh, you know, I want people to see it in the theater. I think it's a, a, a vastly different experience watching a film in the dark, uninterrupted, no cell phone, no pets or kids or phones or, or any outside disturbance. You know, it's a different experience. And, um, and, and we're kind of losing that. Uh, and so my, so we started a Kickstarter campaign to get it into as many theaters as possible. And now it's gonna be in uh, 50 theaters, theaters that would never, ever, ever play in, ever. And um, uh, and I learned about, I, I didn't know about Three Rivers, Michigan, never heard of it before. But now I do, because it's going to play there tonight. Um, and you're also having a uh, pay-as-you-go format. Um, pay what you want. Pay-as-you-go is a little, that'd be minimum, weird, because then we'd lock you in if, unless you paid to leave. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> But uh, <laughs> pay as you go. Um, <laughs> you're going to stay in this theater for a week, young man, until you can get the money from somewhere. You'll be able to see all these first-run films. Sure, that's, we didn't think this out thoroughly, but um, uh, yeah. So it's pay what you want because you know we use Kickstarter funds to go and rent the theaters and pay for the staff and all that stuff, and um, and you know uh, to to supplement it we use kickstarter so hopefully we'll be able to offset some of our costs w w by people pitching in whatever they want but um but the idea was just to get it in as many theaters and in front of as many people as possible that's why i made the film not to make a hundred thousand dollars from you know ifc films or whatever just to, not, not that they just to use them as an example but so as a now a feature director would you do it again Absolutely not, no. <laughs> no, yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was fun. Amy, uh, would you work with David again? Oh, yeah. David was, he, he was a great director. But he kept encouraging you to make stuff up, you know, improvise. You say what you want. You know, you know what's on the page. But for me, when I take the time to memorize something, I'm so proud of myself that uh, <laughs> I know every word that I sometimes I can't get that out of my head. You know what I mean? And I'm, I am an improviser. So I, but I, for this, you know, I don't think I improvised anything, which is also, it was great. And I got to work with Meredith. How'd you find Meredith, by the way? That was uh, mm -hmm. casting, because the, the girl who was going to play Meredith um, backed out about a month before we were supposed to start shooting. And it, you know, that's a, f it really fucks you up. It's, it, it was a, 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 that was tough. And we, we thought we were gonna lose some of our invest, investor money and stuff, and it was really not cool. Um, so then we had a scramble, and I went out to L.A., and uh, do you know Jeannie McCarthy? Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Jeannie, I called Jeannie, and I was like, I've got an emergency. Here's this script. I sent it to her, and, and she, because I don't know young girls. I don't know, uh, or I don't know that, you know what I mean? I don't know that world. I don't, I don't. Uh, Red flag. It's the restraining order. I'm not allowed. <laughs> uh, but I don't know that, the, the, like, everybody else in the film are friends of mine, and, uh, and I, you know, called Amy and called you know, Matt and Dave and all those people, and uh, and they're like, yeah, sounds great, but I just don't know. And and Jake, who's plays uh, Corey, I don't know, he's 16, and uh, 
So Jeannie McCarthy set up a couple weekend sessions, and I flew out to L.A., and we read a lot of people. And then, um, and then I kept going back to Meredith, who had gotten the script, couldn't be in L.A., so sent an audition, like read the lines, had somebody hold an iPhone. Um, and she was awesome. She was great. And uh, I kept... She was like one of my first choices. I kept coming back to her, but th then I was reading people live, and we'd have callbacks, and then a third round of callbacks for like winnow it down to like three or four people, and and I just kept going back to Meredith, and uh, um, and my wife, who's in the business, was very instrumental in going. You gotta you gotta give her the opportunity to come in live, and so I flew back to New York because she was here, and I asked UCB for their theater for a couple hours and uh, read her and and my wife. Uh, read along and um, uh, and then w literally there were a couple of women who were on the East Coast that I couldn't see so uh, who were there and then we just knew it was Meredith so that's I'd never heard of her before she was, I think she did soap operas right mm -hmm. but it was great working with her because you know she gave it her all so it was easy to, to the expression because I'm like what are you doing <laughs> who are you doing this for I mean she was doing she just did a, gave a hundred percent, so it was fun to be in scenes with her because I just felt like she was, she really was that character. But you, you know? so you didn't improvise at all, do you think? I don't think so. Maybe a word here and there, but no. And I just had a tooth pulled, and there was a death in my family, so it was, I wasn't up to par. Which one was worse? <laughs> Ooh. So, um, but it, and also when I read the script, which I thought, I mean, I laughed. When I got the script, I laughed. I wrote everything down that made me laugh. I thought it was hilarious. But, you know, at first, when I said that my character would eat Doritos, I was like, I can't do the movie. I can't eat Doritos. I just had a jute pole. Can we can find something else, Amy. So he gave me marshmallows, which was great, because then they'd get stuck in my missing tooth, and it was very comfortable. <laughs> Perfect it's size. So, it's and so trippy that something could get stuck in a missing tooth. <laughs> I mean, and you just had two teeth. You just went yeah, through the experience. I had stitches. Seems like every time I do a movie, I have stitches in my mouth. You know. It was over a year and a half. I had forty-four total stitches. I think. Oh my god. It was awful. God. It was a terrible. Yeah. So that's um, funny. I, I, I'm uh, first-generation American British, so uh, just awful. <laughs> my DNA is not good. It's really bad. So you mentioned uh, Amy that uh, you had to. Uh, you did not improvise a lot, but is that how you like to work as an actor, David? To have I do, and and uh, um, I mean, and the way uh, any any time any project I've done, uh, I've always cast with an eye towards people who are skilled or adept at uh, improvising, because I think you just find parts of your character that that maybe I as the writer haven't discovered, and they're and they're it's really cool, and it and it opens up all new worlds, and uh, um, uh, and I can't help. But improvise sometimes, especially if I know that the they've got what they wanted that was on the page, and uh, it's almost like Tourette's for me. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I'm doing scenes and I can't not do it. And uh, um, I mean, we we did that a lot on. Uh, we we shot a pilot. Uh, we got to work together <laughs> on this pilot that that didn't go. Um, but we had a couple scenes and we were improvising all over the yeah, place. Yeah, it was you fun. Just can't, and it's such a joy. It's a fucking treat. And it's the thing I missed about acting in this, like especially the scenes in the diner, um, oh. uh, a number of which aren't in the film. They'll be in the extras just because they were too funny and it fucked up the flow of it. But um, uh, I so wanted to get in there and just be, oh. you know. Just, you want to play. You want to yeah. play. It's really frustrating not to do that and just sit behind the thing. But it, I laughed a lot. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I always, I always like to make sure we get what's on the page, what's necessary, and then just have fun. And we, we do Todd Margaret, and I tell the directors, I, you know, that shot you want, that really cool shot from up there where it kind of pushes in, but it's like a rack focus thing from the top of the roof that's going to take an hour to set up. Lose it because I'd rather spend that hour, you know, with the actors finding shit. It's much more valuable to me. And he had his eye on everything. Like at one in the bar scene that someone had made a martini, but they put like an orange, an umbrella, and a cherry. <laughs> and then, I don't know if you remember that, but you immediately saw it through the lens and you were like, get that thing out of there. Who did this? You know, and you would scratch it. But I always thought, oh, that's good. You really paid attention to those little details. Well, I, I live there faults. and it's just yeah. wouldn't, uh, um, I mean, that's, you know, that's their job is to come, the set director to do right, that right, stuff, right. but it's just not real. It wasn't right for the scene. It's called um, a flag, by the way, bartender. <laughs> If there are any uh, uh, would-be bartenders here. Yeah. 
So as a director, writer, actor, stand-up, what's your favorite of the jobs? Craft services, you know, I, I do. I'm the guy who puts the peanut butter filling into the pretzels, the nuggets, and, um, and I, I studied for two years abroad in a, uh, abroad. Uh, outside a, a factory outside of Beijing to learn how to do that. <laughs> and it is a treat. Um, it is exceptional. And, it's, and you see the people's faces light up when you oh, get yeah. that Costco like tub and you dump it in the bowl. <laughs> oh, Chowder. It's, a, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Uh, Amy, how was craft services on the film? It just sucked. It was, it was no budget. <laughs> <laughs> how many raisins can you eat? You're like... It was well, a really old tiny toothless town. Toothless wonder over here. You're, yeah, half toothless the deliciousness wonder. you couldn't have. So, <laughs> actually, I did one of the the few things you can't control, and I know this from 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 you know uh, working in front of the camera on so many low budget things. One of the things I knew as a producer that I, I, I could control was catering, and I and I said to them early before we started shooting, like, let's find some extra money, a little bit extra money, to make catering good so that it doesn't suck because we're asking these people to work really hard lugging around cables and setting up lights it's in the summer nobody's getting paid anything six day weeks you know just make sure you have a good lunch it makes a huge difference and the hotel had a radio that was nice <laughs> <laughs> it said radio in every room perfect it's like why does it smell like chlorine there's no pool <laughs> <laughs> and the radio only played uh, Casey Kasem's Top 40 from 1987. Yeah, bless his heart. <laughs> it's on a loop. <laughs> Evergreen. Do we have any questions in-house? If you do, there's two microphones in both the aisles. Uh, I'll call on you if, uh, if you're up there. Just want to let you guys know. Um, so Liberty, New York. It's uh, the reason you actually filmed everything in-house, as you said. Um, it's where you're living up there. I don't live in Liberty. I live in a town about 22 minutes, roughly. Boy, that is roughly? That's exact. Uh, <laughs> roughly 22 minutes, 17 seconds away from uh, the literal town dividing line. Um, no, I, I live, yeah, 20, 25 minutes away. So uh, or I have a place up there. And um, uh, But when we were scouting, like Liberty, and I just on my own, uh, actually, before this there were producers involved when I was looking. Uh, I mean, all the stuff you see in the movie, all that signage, that's real. That's there. That's in Liberty. Uh, tons of American flags in, in various forms of, uh, of, you know, from new to ratty and torn. But uh, um, it's, you couldn't, I mean, you can't, I mean, that's a lot of production value that's, that's essentially for free, you know? And, and I even toyed with calling the movie Liberty for a little while, but... Oh, Liberty would have been good. I like Hitch, though. It's kind of perfect. Uh, Hitch has the double meaning, which mm -hmm. I like, so... Yeah. You know. <coughs> All right, so um, in addition to this film, I know everyone here wants to hear you talk about some other things, so if you don't mind, I just wanted to ask you what it feels like to be as busy as you must be, considering Todd Margaret... Arrest Development, which is something that's always in everyone's mind. If there's going to be another season, if there's going to be the rumored I, I movie. I haven't heard a thing about it. Uh, and not that that's out of the ordinary. I mean, usually uh, Jason was really good about keeping everybody linked in, um, which would be a great name for a website that would allow for better. <laughs> Write that down. Um, we, will you bing and see if it's an <laughs> Bing. <laughs> He's talking to the um, right person. Uh, uh, no, I don't know. I haven't heard anything. I know Mitch is busy. I know Will's doing this other thing. It, it, the thing about Arrested that was so difficult was, it, and I don't think people understand this, like when it's a studio and you're doing a show, you're, all these people are hired for that set period of time, and we weren't, and it didn't go that way. Otherwise, every, and, a, and between a third and a f half of the cast lives in New York, you know, and uh, you would have to bring everybody out there and give them a, you know, if, if you didn't live there, like a, a stipend to, to, you know, put them up in hotels or whatever it is. And, um, and that's where you are, and you're paid to be there for eight months um, to shoot it, and they didn't do that. And so there was a, it got spread out for uh, much longer than, than we thought it would, and we were getting calls, all of us, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I know we just sent you home, but can you come back Tuesday for a scene? You know, stuff like that. And uh, that was spread out over um, over a year, well over a year, a year and a half. Um, and 
so that makes it really, really difficult. And everybody's so busy. But I can say that I, I think I speak for everybody that we would love to do something again. It's a really, nobody is uh, uh, unaware or unappreciative uh, of how special that show is and how much fun it is and how universally loved it is, uh, except in Nigeria, fuck them. Um, <laughs> But it's such a fun character to do, great people to play with, and great writing, so, you know. But I haven't heard anything at all, sorry. Um, one more, the rumors about Mr. Show. I, uh, Bob and I are uh, working together to work together. Um, <laughs> we have been meeting for about a month now, a little over a month. Uh, I'll fly out to LA for a week, fly back here, fly back there, but, you know. Um, and been writing stuff and have gotten together with the other writers. And we, I cannot say uh, specifically what we're going to be doing, but we will be doing something. We're very excited about it. Uh, it won't be Mr. Show, per se, but it will be a sketch show that Bob and I, you know, same sensibilities, same, hopefully same group of people. And uh, look for it in a TV box soon-ish. Yeah. And in, with London, I've always wanted to work in London. It, it, is it really different to, to shoot something there, like opposed to the United States? Like, what's the difference I mean, um, besides the accents? Uh, I, I, I have not noticed the accent difference at all. Everybody keeps <laughs> mentioning it. Um, it's, uh, it's a little less, um, and this is both good and bad, but it's a little less, um, it, it's, it's definitely more, uh, uh, people don't give a shit. There's no, uh, this idea of like locking down streets unless you're this massive budgeted, you know, if it's Sherlock or Harry Potter or something, yeah, of course you can lock down streets, but you know, it just, you just, it's not like New York or LA when you're, when you get a big police presence that allows you to shoot the thing. And we, we with Todd Margaret, our budget's so low and we have to steal so much shit. Um, in fact, we were shooting, we were shooting a scene in front of, uh, it was in the first series, and it's when I'm first going to the pub with Sharon Horgan, Alice. And uh, we're shooting this thing, and this guy walks up the street, this uh, <laughs> like 55, 60 year old black guy, and he comes up and he sees the camera, and he's like, ah, and he tips his hat, and he, had, and, uh, he starts talking to us. And uh, it was just like, <laughs> that's, it's not, like, they don't care. There's no, like, oh, sh you, don't, you don't instinctively go, I better cross the street. Or um, uh, it just they don't care. And the the positive side of that is, I've I'll go to there's a couple different pubs there that a lot of the comic community uh, go to. And um, there's one especially on Dean Street, and it's a small pub. And you go and you're sitting there. And you're like, holy shit! I'm sitting there with these comedy gods, wow. and everybody's having a drink, and nobody gives a shit. You know, I, I was having a drink with Simon Pegg. Nobody gave a fuck. And, and you don't get that here. People are like, oh my God, tell me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but did you, and did you like living there? Would you think? I love it, yeah. yeah I, 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 love really, I really like it. And I, if, it's, it gets very lonely for me if uh, my wife's not there. And, uh, um, you know, especially, you know, work is great. But at the end of the day, everybody's got families or uh, partners that they go back to, and then you're just sort of sitting there. Sometimes they'll throw you a bone, they can tell you're lonely, and they'll have a few drinks with you at a pub, but then they gotta get back. And everybody, you know, it's, public transportation is, is, a, is, is uh, prevalent, but it's a bit of a mess, it can be. And, uh, you know, and London's really spread out, so you find yourself from about seven o'clock on, just by yourself, eating your, you know, your 28th dinner by yourself and, yeah. you know, um, uh, so that gets kind of lonely and, uh, if, if my wife can't be there, but I had my dog shipped out last, last oh, season. Oh, wow. Yeah, the last series, so that was kind of cool. Um, but I love London. It's yeah. so sad. <laughs> got real, uh, got real dim in here. Alan, uh, Alan, you have a question? Yeah, um, you mentioned that uh, Meredith was hard to cast, but regarding the other characters in the movie, e each one seems so unique and so different from everyone else. Regarding casting, did you have, um, did you have anyone, any actors in mind for the characters, or did you know one lead to the other? Um, I had uh, early on. Um, I, I was. I don't. 
I'm not sure if I had anybody as I was writing it. I think Derek Waters popped into my head as Larson uh, pretty early on. And then uh, I think maybe when I was doing a second draft or a third draft, uh, I, I thought of uh, James Adomian early on. Um, and I thought of uh, Matt Walsh after doing a show with him, an improv show in which he ended up doing the scene that was really poignant, turned into uh, a, a very real, grounded, poignant thing. And I was like, that's my Dave Steuben. Um, so, and I think comics get a, a short shrift um, in being cast in regular dramatic parts. I mean, I, I, Amy's not funny at all, but in, in, I mean, in the movie, in the <laughs> your character. Uh, like, um, yeah, I, I was like, like you're, no, I can't do this. She's like, Amy, you can do it. You can, yeah, talk me just, into just, it. And, and you're great. And you, I believe you. And, uh, and I feel that way about everybody in the film there. I believe them, you know. That was and, my next question. If you had to like convince anyone to do it or if anyone was like, David Cross, who's this schmuck? I don't want to work with him. <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't going after 90-year-old vaudevillian, so <laughs> <laughs> nobody said, who's this schmuck? But uh, uh, <laughs> um, I didn't know people still use that word. Just, I like um, that. Uh, I don't think, I mean, the, well, there was the girl who I didn't know, who, who I knew through a friend um, who bailed on the, the one who was going to be uh, Caitlin. Um, I, I won't say her name, but... Uh, uh, Outside of that, everybody, yeah, everybody kind of jumped at it, like really went out of their way to make it work, too. Like a lot of the, the people who came in from L.A. were, you know, were good enough to figure out their schedule. So I didn't have a problem with anybody, really. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, this is a question for Amy. Um, the I, star of the film. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I love your work. Um, I'm curious uh, if you could talk at all about uh, projects you're currently working on or future projects you're looking at. Um, and I was wondering specifically, are you uh, going to be working at all with Stephen Colbert in the future uh, with his uh, upcoming new show? I know uh, Colbert has asked me to be a guest on his show already, which is fun. I'm looking for. I think Stephen's going to be great. Everything Stephen does is great. I'm going to miss Letterman, and I miss the Colbert Report. You know, um, and right now Paul Dinello and I are working on a writing project, and I'm trying to have a baby. Just kidding. Usually that people gross out. <laughs> 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 but I just got this new wig made for myself, Crystal, who did the wigs on the heart she holler. I flew to um, North Carolina, a Wait, school of the arts. Wait, this is so that you can get a baby? <laughs> yeah, so long. It's like the Heather Lawless wig that she wore in the oh, heart my. she holler, but it's got more bald spots on it, thinning. And I paid $3,000 for it. And I can't wait to bring it alive. I mean, I go to bed like this thinking, okay, who is this woman going to be? I can't do Heather's character. So um, I'm just obsessed with, and I'm just, it's just something for myself. It sounds queer to say I'm going to go play in my wig, but that's what I'm going to do. So, But that's also yeah. how you come up with characters and, and start f figuring out who they are and what yeah, world they live in. Yeah, I love nothing more than that. So. Yeah. That's what I'm... I do, I do the same thing with butt plugs. That's how, I get all, <laughs> that's how all my characters come about. I get a new one in the mail, and, uh, like, who is this guy? Let's <laughs> but find they're out. always three-dimensional, <laughs> yeah. these butt plug characters. They're grounded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Also for Amy, um, he, he basically asked the same question. I loved your work with Stephen Colbert and Paul Donello and Strangers of Candy. Um, were any of your lines uh, improvised? Because you, you said some crazy that. things. Like. It's hard to, because not everybody improvises. So it's hard when you're in a scene with somebody who doesn't. I mean, they're scared to death if you change the script, you know? But we left some wiggle room for that. And when we were writing it, we certainly did. We'd sit around, and then we'd get up on our feet. Like the, uh, the, uh, the cafeteria scene where I first meet Little Nut, you know, where I'm like, you know, <laughs> she's taking care of my baby. Um, we were up till 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning improvising that scene because we had no idea where that episode was going to go. And David Cross, you did an episode, mm -hmm. and um, we hit where uh, lamb blood had to get thrown in my face, and it was so hard not to laugh at him. <laughs> and then I knew that blood was coming, and I only was going to have two chances because of, of wardrobe. But um, that show was a blast because there's Still nobody blurs. was in charge. We were in the woods 
doing a show that nobody, you know, it was like 5.30 Sunday. I mean, nobody was going to watch that show. So, and we didn't know we had fans till we did Wigfield, and then all the ugly people came out, and we were like, who, who are these people? And we were like, oh my God, they're just strangers with candy. They, you know, and that's when we noticed that, you know, we had followers. Well, and I'm awesome happy. Work. I'm happy with that kind of audience. The uglier, the better. It was great. Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Hi, I have uh, one quick question for each of you. Um, to David, one of my favorite movies of yours is Run, Ronnie, Run. I was just wondering if there was any oh, God. chance for a sequel. <laughs> for that, for that I, I mean, <laughs> if we did that character as a 50-year-old, uh, <laughs> probably a little, little less running. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I would I would love to get the chance to do that idea right. Um, uh, you know, we there's we talked about it a lot, but that movie was not what we intended, and it, it got cut together in a completely different way and, uh, than we had uh, desired. But um, I don't think I mean it's a fun character to do, and it kind of comes from like early stand up that uh, just from growing up in Georgia. But uh, I just I think maybe I'll do an older version of, uh, I don't know. It'll be roll, Ronnie, roll <laughs> in a wheelchair. Um, and then to Amy, I love your work on Broad City, um, and I just wanted to hear a little bit about kind of how you work with um, Alana and Abby and how that, that was a, a blast. Together. Well, I went to, I wear a size five shoe, and I went to wardrobe, and they handed me size nine. I was like, perfect. Now, I totally knew what the show was going to be, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I had to wear tube socks. But that was a character I've been working on for a while, so it was a nice, you know, I kind of, you know, got to use it a little bit on that show. And that, there was a lot of improv. But those girls are really silly, really, really funny. I, it, that was a great, great time. Have you, you watched the new episode, the new yeah. season? Yeah, they're hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Size nine shoe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think a lot of New Yorkers go and try and do improv, like situational improv in a kind of casual way. And you can go watch shows everywhere. It's like sort of an entry point. But it seems like such a big step to improvise as a character. You really understand and be consistent. And that wig anecdote really like sparked my imagination of how you're figuring out who these people are and getting ready to improvise particularly. And this applies, I think, for both of you guys. Is there a certain process you have when you're figuring out who someone is so that you can be spontaneous about that as opposed to you know, a more uh, predetermined character? Well, I feel comfortable if I have a mole or a hump or a wig. And I know people say, oh, you're just hiding behind that. And I'm like, OK, that's fine that I'm hiding behind it. But I just feel like I need to feel something different. You know what I mean? Just something to give me a little hook. Uh, when I just look like myself or you have to improvise and heal, you know, it just doesn't, it's not, it's not as fun for me. So I, I, I prefer to have, that's why I like English shows, you know? I mean, I know those are the real teeth. but. You know, uh, I like how broad they can be and really put it out there. But for me personally, it, it helps if I have a little something that, does, that, that, you know, unusual, like a mole or a hump or a wig or something like that, that cesarean scar, anything. <laughs> I mean, I prefer, then I feel like I'm playing. Even if nobody sees it. Even if nobody sees it. I know it's there. I know that butt plug is in me. <laughs> hey, David. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would concur that it's... E e it's um, Putting on any kind of accoutrement uh, gives you an idea. Um, I remember when when Bob and I were uh, starting to write Mr. Show, and there was a ha we were in a this, these shitty offices, tiny, tiny little shitty offices in uh, Hollywood, and in one of the drawers, somebody had left uh, the hat, uh, which was a cap with a ponytail like, uh, <laughs> uh, sewn onto it. So you'd put on the cap, and that became Grass Valley Greg. There was no concept prior to that, to putting on this hat, going, look at this thing. It was like a bad sketch about a bad improv group, about <laughs> you know, taking hats out. And then, uh, but we just started playing around with that, and that became Grass Valley Greg, and then built this idea around it. Um, but he also looked like the guys I lived in um, Cambridge for a little while, and um, all those kind of molecular biology guys who brew their own beer and ride those recumbent bikes to work. And um, he looked like that guy, too. Anyway, uh, 
I hope that answered your question. But you're so good. You're so good at playing straight. Like when you were in Law and Order or even Boss, because you're funny. It's like Bill Murray. You know, you're natural. You want to laugh, even though they're playing perfectly straight. But you're just so good at that. And I always think about you when I have to play something straight. You just you just do it. And but yet, you know, you still want to laugh at you. But you're really good at just playing completely straight. I got a funny face. Yeah. No, it's not your face. <laughs> Just the energy you put behind it or something. It's good. Yes, sir, the guy in the beard. To continue in the uh, Mr. Show vein, I just wanted to let you know that uh, out of every DVD, Blu-ray, anything I've ever owned, nothing has more rewatchable factor to it than that does. I've, I've seen that uh, probably hundreds of times. I just wanted to let you know that... Uh, What's this, Law and Order? Mr. <laughs> show. Wh which one? Mr. Show. Oh, yeah, Mr. Show. It's so good. <laughs> Really, because I, I have a DVD of the uh, NBC Nightly News from August 14th, 1991, <laughs> that I, I have watched a million times. <laughs> there's, a thing of, there's a price of milk rose because of something that happened in Korea, but... Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, do you, uh, do you, I, sorry if I missed this. Uh, I came a little bit late, but do you do any work with Bob anymore? Yeah, uh, um, Bob and I over the years have have done. We've done some benefit stuff, uh, and we will write sketches for that. And uh, and we uh, did a Mister Show tour, and then we did put out a book uh, last year, two yeah, something cool. year and a half ago, um, which was a uh, compilation of uh, a couple movie scripts and then other sketches that we wrote that never made it. Um, uh, in part because Run, Run, Run was such a dismal failure. And uh, so we had these, and we were like, we're never going to make these. We're never going to get a chance to make them. You know, these are, these are made, written by, and meant to star, you know, guys in their early 30s, and it's just not who we are anymore. And, and rather than just keeping, you know, staying on the shelf, uh, we put those out. So we toured behind that. Um, and This is just last year? Uh, yeah, what? it was like a year. Wait, what is it now? It's uh, uh, 2015. 2015. But I mean, okay, so uh, <laughs> right? it was like a year and four months ago, something oh, like that. Sorry, I the missed fall it. of not. I, I can't. Google it. And and we we have amassed a number of sketches that that we'd like people to see and. And we knew that the 20th anniversary of the the first year of Mr. Show was coming up, so um, you know we we are we're in talks about doing it, and we will do something. I, I promise. I know it's it's uh, I don't not to jinx it, uh, but it's going to happen. So um, we've been getting together. I leave for L.A. on Sunday, and I'm going to be there. I mean, this is all you know. We're ready to go, and. Uh, I'm not back home until mid-July because I got to go straight to London as soon as we're done there to, for Todd Margaret. So um, I'll miss y'all. I uh, look forward <laughs> to seeing how the city has grown and changed while I'm gone. Um, uh, but yeah, I leave Sunday for LA and we'll be there working on it. Cool. Well, please uh, pass my compliments along to Bob as well. Um, <laughs> what do you pass the compliments on to Bob as well. I'll no, make sure no, he does. I'll absolutely not. <laughs> Yes. Hi. Yeah, thanks for coming. We have such um, two days in a row now, really funny people that are also associated with UCB. Wait, Dick Cabot was here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so there are a ton of people that go through UCB for classes, which means there are a lot of people who love improv and love to be funny, and uh, those classes fill up really quickly. And I wonder, there is a site LinkedIn already for business people where we connect and we sometimes have um, mentors that we reach out to or we it, connect with improv people or? some way or other. And these are not the improv people. So I'm imagining that improv people have their own way of reaching out and networking. And I wonder if you can give us some inside insights into maybe if you are a mentor for others or if others are mentors for you. I don't know what you're talking about. I know, I, you're talking about, um, I think this is right, there's the, the Third bar stool from the left, uh, counting as you walk in the door of McManus, the uh, McManus Tavern. There's <laughs> always notes going? left under there. Um, <laughs> and that's that. I mean, it's a little archaic and it's old school, but that's how improv people connect with each other. And then they'll the only way. Yeah, leave a note. Um, 
they're not tech savvy at all. Uh, uh, and I, I truly didn't understand the question. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> whether, whether we were, sorry. It probably was not a question. Um, so the question is, uh, do you find time to mentor others? And how do you connect with those people? And do other people also become your mentors? Is it like this official thing, Sheryl Stanberg's book is like, don't ask for a mentor. But then at Google, they're like, ask for a mentor, because they'll help you. Uh, well, I think lesson learned is don't trust Google. Um, <laughs> uh, I, well, not officially. I don't know of uh, people who really. I mean, I'm sure there are some who kind of uh, more uh, in a in a structured way mentor somebody, but I, I don't know of anybody offhand. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm trying to raise my wife, and that's a difficult <laughs> thing to do, um, and and guide her through this world. It's a um, full full time job. It is, and. Uh, um, but I don't. I don't really do that. I mean, in this. I mean, look. We we all help people along, and that's one one of the great uh, um, unspoken things, you know, uh, or underappreciated things about comics in this industry and comic actors. And you know, uh, you, we all bring people up and uh, um, and and encourage other people to hire them and work with them and take people who, you know deserve a chance, you know, I, I got my start on writing on the Ben Stiller show. I was a guy in Boston nobody had heard of, and uh, and that's where I met Bob, actually, and, um, you know, so I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Janine Garofalo, Ben Stiller, and Judd Apatow. I wouldn't be sitting here, and um, I saw Tenacious D at a, uh, a place called uh, Al's Bar, and something called No Talent Night in downtown L.A. a long time ago, <laughs> and, you know, brought them into, like said, hey, I'm doing these series of shows, so, and then they in turn brought people in, and um, and Bob uh, are, is is very responsible for uh, Tim and Eric being on the air, and, and, oh, and Tim and Eric so in turn have, I mean, that's just how it works, and it's a, it's a great part of this business, and, and there's not a lot of, um, or certainly less than in other industries, I think less ego, more cooperative, uh, uh, you know, it's, you serve the greater good for the, the product and the thing and the art, and, uh, and that's one of the great things about, you know, this comic community, comedy community. Great, thanks. All right, guys, thank you so much for being here. Okay. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Guys, uh, if you haven't already, be sure to check out Hits on uh, BitTorrent and Pay What You Want mm -hmm. and or in theaters around the country. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Thank really you. Appreciate it. All right, man, thanks. Bye.